All right. So characteristics. Remember that when we were talking, we had the two groups. That was MTBC. That was um, the ones capable of causing TB. And then you had NTM, which would be non-tuberculosis mycobacterium. So one of the most important things to remember about NTM is that they're going to be groups based on the pigmentation, okay, and their growth characteristics. So you have two things that they're going to be able to um, identify with from there. So pigmentation and growth characteristics. And you guys remember that these are all slow-growing bacilli, okay, and you need enhanced um, CO2 as well. And lipid-containing structures, so obviously they're not going to gram stain very well. So your method of choice is going to be acid fest on most of them. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, actually, I don't know if you guys know this, there's over 130 species, which is interesting. And then this is just saying um, two categories again. The other thing with NCMs, they're in the environment, okay, and they're usually soft tissue or lymphatic infections. Versus MTBC, they're going to be capable of causing tuberculosis. I'm going to keep saying that over and over and over because that will come up in the test all the time. Um, and most of the time, you guys, the questions are actually going to say like NTM, da 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 da, da questions. So just remember which is which because that's how I'll refer to them in the test, okay? Everybody's good with the categories? Yes? Yeah? All right. Um, specimen collection. Frequently involves lungs, obviously. Um, these were, would be the acceptable respiratory specimens, that list. And then they have a couple other criteria here as well. With the sputum, um, they like to get it from a deep cough. And early morning specimens is usually what they recommend, and it's on three consecutive days is what they like. They don't like to do it over 24 hours, but they'd rather have it on three consecutive days for the recommendation for specimen collection. Okay, with that continued, you have urine as well. Um, they're going to have to centrifuge that. Sterile fluid as well is going to get centrifuged. Um, blood, you have lysis cent centrifugation. And then you also have tissue. The other one that I wanted to mention that's not on here is they do have fecal specimens. And this is going to be used to isolate mycobacteria of avium, A-V-I-U-M. And this usually affects AIDS patients, OK? So there are um, fecal specimens. All right, in terms of processing, when they're going to process them, right, and submit them for ID, usually you have this risk of them being contaminated with normal flora. So they do what's called decontamination, OK? And that's how they do it, is either with the 2%. Um, and they, the other thing is, is because they're slow growing, usually they are going to be overgrown with contaminants. Okay, so decontamination usually always takes place. Now, in terms of like if you have a sputum sample, you're going to have to decontaminate, and then they're also going to be digested as well, which basically just means that they're splitting disulfide bonds. Okay, the ones that you don't have to decontaminate would be the sterile specimens, such as like the CSF. So those get by without decontamination because obviously they're supposed to be sterile. Okay. Now staining wise, so the acid fast stain is like your preliminary ID. Okay. However, if you get a negative result that doesn't eliminate the possibility of tuberculosis because the sensitivity isn't the best. Okay. And then within acid staining, you have something that's called a hot method and a cold method. Hot method is just involving with a hot plate. Cold method, you don't heat up the samples at all, okay? Um, within that, you also have individual stains. You have fluorochrome um, and rhodamine as well, okay? Let me see. Is there anything else I need to tell you guys? The R being O, it will actually stain like a yellow-green, and the rhodamine is actually a counter stain that will stain red, okay? All right, so culture media. So the Lostein Jensen, there's a picture of it, and that's the one I just showed you guys um, that's up on the table there. So it's very bright. So this is going to be egg-based. So in the book, they had it broken down to non-selective and selective and then transparent or auger-based media. 
If that's confusing to you guys, you don't need to know those categories. You just need to be basically familiar with the names of these medias. Okay? The most important ones would really be the low steam Jensen, and then the middle brook as well is going to be important. Okay? Um, the other ones, eh, not so, or the other one, I should say, that's left, not so much. Okay? But you can X out the categories if it's confusing. And then again, Generally, um, incubation for a total of eight to 10 weeks before growth is reported as negative, which is a very long time. Yeah, in, ter in terms of saying something's negative, they usually have to wait eight to 10 weeks, okay? Which is insane if you think about that. All right, one of the things I wanted to mention on here, is this is just a brief summary of the traditional biochemical techniques However, they don't necessarily do a lot of these biochemical techniques anymore. They would usually use um, commercial tests instead. But you still kind of need to know, you know these different categories as well. So growth rate is going to be, an average time is three weeks, and that's pretty fast. Usually it's longer than that. You hit more about 10, 8 to 10. Um, pigment production. When they're looking at that, they're actually looking at the color, obviously, but they're also looking at like the size of the colony and the elevation, density, that type of thing, um, within pigment. So that would be morphology and pigment production. And then growth temperatures. You had a wide range, and you guys saw that um, the last class period. Um, they group them together depending on where the bacteria are coming from, whether it was like a skin isolate or environmental isolate. Okay. Um, so the rest of this list I want to just point out on number eight and number nine, you would need to know that these two examples, okay, for the tween 80 that you have Canassi, and then on number nine you have Fortic, um, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure. Um, okay, and those would both be positives, all right? And basically both of those are paper strips that turn a specific color if that's the organism that comes into play, okay? Um, you have a couple more biochemical reactions that they're used to here. Um, tuberculosis and marinum for number 10, positive. And then number 11, bovis, is positive for urease, okay? And then you have number 12, the growth in 5%, salt, everything cannot grow except for that one, all right? And then you have iron uptake, you have what's called rapid growers. There's not specific ones on this one. Um, and then you have growth on MAC as well. But what's interesting on the MAC, it has to be um, a formulation that doesn't contain crystal violet for them to actually grow, which is kind of bizarre. So if it doesn't contain crystal violet, you won't see like lactose fermentation. Um, you won't see the color change, okay? Um, all right, well, like I said, most of the time it's going to be automated systems that you're looking at. So individual infections, you have tuberculosis, which is um, considered a chronic infection. Um, usually it's in places where there's close contact or um, impoverished communities. Um, Cell-mediated immunity, that's going to be your primary host defense. And another problem is that you have very few clinical signs early in the infection, okay? And this is gonna be transmitted person to person through the air, okay? And then individuals with diminished um, cellular mediated immunity are gonna be at increased risk to actually get the infection. Um, the other thing is if you have secondary tuberculosis, this would occur in people who have had primary tuberculosis or had a pulmonary disease. So you can get that on top of on top of the infection, which is great news. Okay. <laughs> For diagnosis and identification, your go-to thing that most of the time happens is this TST skin test. And this will determine whether an individual has been exposed or not. And they'll read the site at 48 hours and they'll look on the skin to see if there's redness or not. And a lot of times you get false negative reactions, okay? And that could be because of a suppressed immune system or somebody that had a recent or old infection, that type of thing. Um, there's also a vaccine as well. Um, the GRAs, this is basically blood tests to detect uh, tuberculosis infection, okay? 
And then as a whole, they're just going to be slightly curved acid fast bacilli, non pigmented. So these guys aren't going to have a color. And then they fail to grow at those various temperatures. Usually they do it around 37, 35 to 37. And then that's what the biochemically, what it's positive for. Okay? Anybody have questions about um, tuberculosis? Nope. All right. Treatment is long term multi drug therapy for sure. And you're talking about months on that. So then they have a first line. That's your examples for your first line. Second line is going to be administered if the first line fails. Okay, and you're talking about a two month treatment basically, and then you're on for an additional four to seven months. Um, MDR TB, that just means multi drug resistant TB, okay, indicates that the first line is resistant um, to the drug. So that's what you have in terms of treatment. You're on for a very long, long time. All right, Mycobacterium ulcerans. Um, these actually have a slight pigmentation. So palish, buff, um, whitish colonies. Um, six to 12 weeks to grow. So that's another really long time. They're not going to grow at 24, and these aren't going to grow at 35 to 37. See how picky these guys are? Uh, each one of them have their own thing going on, OK? Um, and this one is particularly hard because it's classified as biochemically inert, meaning that it has very few positive reactions. However, one of the ones that are positive is called heat-stable catalase. And basically, that's just a catalase test that's heated up, OK? Um, and this one, infection-wise, it causes what's known as Bermuli ulcers, which are really gnarly looking. And basically, you can almost see into the ulcer, into like organs. That's how deep the ulcer goes. Um, so direct contact, and usually it's contaminated water sources. This is a picture of one on somebody's mm. face, which is great. It's usually in subtropical areas that you find this guy, OK? Yeah, that's good times. Um, bovis. So this would be TV, usually in cattle, OK? Um, however, humans can get this one as well. Um, bovis is going to grow at 35 to 37 degrees. Does not grow at 24 to 42, but 35 to 37. This one, it needs six to eight weeks to grow, and they're going to put it on the LJ or Lostein Jensen media. And the other thing is it can grow on the Middlebrook media, and it's going to actually look like water droplets, which is interesting. This is one of the uh, key ways that they can actually see that this might be bovis. It's like that water droplet formation. Okay? And then you can see how it's differentiated from tuberculosis as well. Tuberculosis, tuberculosis would have a positive reaction, whereas this one has a negative reaction. Okay. Um, Leprae. So if you have agent of Hansen's disease or leprosy, it affects skin, mucous membrane, and peripheral nerves. So then you have two types there. You have tuberculoid leprosy, and then you have Hansen's disease. So on Hansen's disease, it's more widespread, okay? And it's more systemic, skin lesions and nodules. Um, they're going to look at this one through um, acid fast staining, okay? And they're going to look at skin lesions and also clinical symptoms before they actually identify it. The thing that's bad with this one is that it can be cultured in vitro. So this is one of the only ones that they can't grow it up in the lab. All right. Um, starting with this one, these are considered photochromogens. If you guys remember, they um, will turn a color. So you can start seeing now where you get into like your yellows and pinks. Um, so this guy is going to be a yellow bacillus. It's one of the quicker ones. It grows in 14 to 28 days which is actually considered pretty quick. Um, it won't grow at 42. has a rapid between 80 and also rapid catalase test. OK? I would focus, for you guys, when you're looking at these, more on what the positives are versus the negatives. Meaning, you know, what are the positive tests and not worry so much about what the bacteria is negative for. OK? Because so that's where I'm going to ask you questions. Well, it's positive for this, it's positive for that, but not negative. Okay, so you can 
cross a little bit out, not too much. Um, in terms of looking for this one, they're going to use an uh, inflated acid probe. And then infection-wise, it's going to be chronic pulmonary disease. Okay, It can also cause soft tissue infections as well. Um, usually, the infections don't disseminate unless the host is severely immunocompromised. Okay, So usually, it will stay where it is, considering the, what the host uh, immune status is. Marinum. All right. Um, have you guys ever heard of this one? This, you can get this from water, okay? And a lot of times you look at things like fish tanks or swimming pools. So you're talking about poorly or uncoordinated water that it can live in. Um, it grows at 30 to 32. And usually it's um, going to be skin infections and they look like red to blue lesions, okay? So that would be the sort of the telltale um, the lesions because on uh, actual media, it's not necessarily pigmented very brightly. In case we'll look at the lesions in order to identify. The lesions are red and blue? Yes. And then usually you'll get nodules on the elbows, knees, toes, or fingers is where it likes to go hang out. Okay? Then you have avium. And I mentioned that one before about the fecal sample, so don't forget about that. Okay? Um, this is opportunistic. AIDS patients are particularly affected by this. Um, contaminated food or water, and it's through inhalation. It will grow at 35 to 37. Again, when you're looking at growth rates, look at what it grows at, not what it doesn't grow at. So don't worry about 42 and 24, those numbers. Just kind of focus on that it grows at 35 to 37 degrees, okay? And then the other important thing is the biochemical reactions. They're all negative except for those two. And on this one, in order to identify, you also need an clinic acid probe as well. Okay, and then there's a picture of that one. All right, does anybody have any questions about the mycobacteria? It's a lot of information, but if you guys focus on the positives and the growth temperatures, I think you should do okay in terms of biochemicals. <laughs> All right, objectives, okay, nervous system. So CNS, we're talking about brain, spinal cord, and cranial nerves, but not the peripheral nerves, okay? For CNS, that would be considered the PNS. Um, meninges, this, I think, should be a review. So this is just six. talking it's about meninges and the CSF. In terms of the CSF, um, you do need to know these characteristics, and I would Imagine that you would have had this possibly in Aaron's class. Yes? Yeah, yeah that. With the protein and the glucose and that type of thing? Okay. So the protein and then the glucose, you need to have these numbers down as well. So there will be questions about that on the test for sure. Okay? So that's that. Then straight up definitions for nervous system. Um, meningitis and then encephalitis, okay, or you can have inflammation of both, which is really bad news. Okay, so in terms of infections of the nervous system, let's we'll start with bacterial meningitis, okay? Um, so acute meningitis, you're going to be commonly caused by bacteria, and you really have three offenders that they usually go to. You're going to be thinking of strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitis, or Haemophilus influenza are usually your go-tos, okay? Um, so fever, headache, stiff neck are your traditional symptoms. And when I say headache, it's not just like headache. It's headache, ow, like the light is bothering you, your worst migraine ever type of thing. Um, usually it can be followed by nausea and vomiting. And then you can actually get into convulsions as well. On this one, they're going to do diagnosis by grand stain and latex agglutination of the CSF, so you're going to have to have um, the spinal tap done. Yeah, which is loads of fun. Here it is, right there. Doesn't really show you that much, though. It just shows you where. Um, but the needle is ridiculous. Um, what? Have you seen it? Yeah, it's good times for anybody that's getting it. So this would be the first step, okay? They're going to do a lumbar puncture. Um, within the three bacteria, you have Haemophilus influenza. All of these are differentiated a little bit from each other. So this one's going to occur mostly in children. 
But now that you have the HID vaccine, that actually has helped reduce numbers greatly. But in countries where they don't have this vaccine, you still get hit with this one a lot, okay? And this one's gonna be gram negative. And you guys remember that this is normal throat microbiota as well. And your biggest offender would be antigen type B, okay? Um, Neisseria, on the other hand, you're talking gram negative, and it also has a capsule, okay? 10% of people are actually carriers of it. And on this one, this usually begins as a throat infection, and then you get some sort of rash that goes with it. You guys sort of remember this, we have the serotypes and where is where. You're not gonna be tested on that. I just wanna make sure that you guys can sort of differentiate between the three bacteria. But on the serotypes, don't worry about that so much. Or the vaccine, you don't really need to know that either. We've already gone over that, okay? Picture of Neisseria. Okay, and then the Streptococcus pneumoniae. All right, this one is differentiated because it's a gram-positive diplococcus, okay? And on this one, the numbers are huge. 70% are gonna be healthy carriers. Again, common in young children or elderly. And this one's also prevented by uh, vaccination as well, okay? What more, sir? It's, it's good stuff. Yeah. All right. This was Lauren's baby right here. The steria. So but this can actually cause a nerve infection as well. Okay. Um, so gram negative fraud. This is Lauren went over this in great detail. It's usually foodborne, can be transmitted to the fetus. Okay. Um, not too much information here. Tetanus, so clostridium, gram positive. This is one that has endospores, okay? And know just the pathways that it affects, basically. Um, you don't need to know the vaccination or the treatment. That's fine. Just the basics of that it's gram positive and that it has endospores. And it grows deep in wounds. Or it grows in deep wounds, excuse me. There's an advanced case right there where they literally cannot move. Okay. That looks like a comfortable position, doesn't it? Uh, it looks pretty bad. It looks pretty bad, right? All right, then you have clostridium botulism. We've just gone over this again, so I'm not really gonna spend time on this, okay? Um, just basically know the difference between this one and tetanus, all okay? right? And this again is still gonna be very positive endospore forming. Okay. And treatment, and then you have infant, and you have wound botulism as well, okay? And I think we talked about that a little bit. And the botulism types, you guys can actually even X this out of your um, packet if you want to. I'm not gonna ask you about this. Um, leprosy, Hansen's disease, what we just talked about, acid fast rod, um, goes in the peripheral nerves. What I wanted to show you on this one was Here's the two different types that we were talking about before, but actually I wanted to show you the pictures of the different types. So that's tuberculoid leprosy right there. Okay, you can see the difference. And then here is the progressive leprosy, where you can see there's like nodules on the fingers. So you can see the difference sort of clinically. Okay, I don't know which one would be more painful, but I'm gonna guess that one. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll pass. Do you think so? All right, you also have polio, okay, so transmitted by ingestion. Initial symptoms are nondescript, again, sore throat and nausea. Um, you also can have viremia, which happens sometimes, and of course, we have prevention because we have the vaccination for polio. So honestly, what I'm thinking about this section, you guys, is that it really should be fairly easy. So there's not too many things in here that you guys aren't familiar with. Um, Rabies virus, initial symptoms again. Hydrophobia is one of the ones that's more interesting in terms of symptoms. All right, prion diseases of the nervous system. These are the more interesting ones. All right, so you have a couple uh, different ones. The ones that we're gonna talk about is spongy form encephalopathy. okay? So you have the typical diseases that are listed there. I think somebody did a prion presentation, if I'm not mistaken, in here. Okay, the problem with the prions is that they're being very, very hard to kill. Basically, they don't get killed by anything. 
Um, and you can see that chronic and fatal. All right. Um, they're going to be acquired a couple different ways. Ingestion, that was like when you guys used to hear about the mad cow disease. It was ingestion of contaminated meat, inherited, um, or from transplant. Okay? And like I just said, they're very difficult to destroy. Now, the last one that I wanted to talk about, which is kind of an interesting one, is chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay? So, this would be unexplained fatigue, and it's going to have to last six months, and you have to have four of these symptoms to actually make a diagnosis, which can be hugely difficult because they're all kind of nondescript symptoms, okay? Or you could be looking at somebody that's just basically going through depression, all right? So this one, chronic fatigue syndrome, it's very hard to diagnose, and most people just usually don't get a diagnosis with it, okay? Anybody have somebody that they knew that actually went through this? Because it's kind of not that common, you know? All right, and experimental treatment, basically, for chronic fatigue syndrome.